it says it's recording. All right, good evening, everybody, and thanks for your attendance uh, for the uh, weekly Wednesday webinar. And we're delighted this evening to have uh, the fantastic Professor Pam Snow. Pam was a former uh, council member for LDA uh, and is a professor of cognitive psychology and also um, a qualified speech pathologist and one of the real experts in Australia, particularly in the area of reading. And uh, Pam's got a fascinating session for us lined up this evening. So uh, really look forward to it. And I'll hand straight over to you, Pam, so you can get straight into it. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. And hello, everyone. I'm hoping that you can see my screen. Is that right? Yep. Great. Terrific. Okay. So um, what I'm going to talk about tonight, um, I guess, really um, builds on um, a a couple of decades of research that I've been fortunate to be involved in um, and trying to pull a few different threads together uh, from that research and the various spaces that I um, enjoy working and um, researching and teaching in. So I'm just going to try and get my screen to respond to. Okay, so this is um, a bit of an overview of the kind of territory that I want to cover tonight. I want to start off, um, because we're talking about the school to prison pipeline, I want to talk a little bit about um, how youth justice works in Australia, what the philosophical orientation is, and give you a bit of a helicopter view of some demographic factors in that space. Um, we'll talk a little bit about oral language competence, um, what it is and why it's important for all young people. That is one of my particular things, I suppose, that as a speech pathologist, I'm not just interested in language disorders. I'm also interested in flipping that around the other way and looking at language competence and how we can promote and develop language competence not just at an individual level, but really at a population level and make that a protective factor. So we'll look at risk and protective factors in early life, um, the school to prison pipeline. I'll uh, show you a little bit about some of our research on the um, oral language and to some extent literacy skills of vulnerable young people. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the language learning behaviour nexus and touch on some implications of the research. I was just saying to Michael, I've probably tried to fit too much into this presentation. So we'll see how we go. Now, I thought it might be useful to start off by um, just, as I said, having a bit of a helicopter look at how youth justice works in Australia. In the main, we take a very um, progressive and I would say well-informed um, position on youth justice. We take a diversionary therapeutic jurisprudence approach, our, our approach to young people who offend is based on um, principles and knowledge and research about uh, risk factors in childhood that lead some people into the youth justice system. So we don't take um, the harsh punitive approach that unfortunately, for example, is associated with many parts of the United States of America. Um, and one of the key reasons that we don't take a harsh punitive approach, in fact, is um, that the research shows that it doesn't work. Um, so it's, it's not um, necessarily just about ideology and philosophy. If you want to be empirical about it, um, harshly punish it, punishing young people who have um, done wrong in the eyes of the law actually doesn't turn them into better citizens. Um, now, the age of criminal culpability, and this is controversial um, in Australia, is 10. And I want to talk about the legal notion of Dolly Incapax and uh, what that is and what it means for the age of criminal culpability. Bear in mind, though, that um, the age of uh, criminal culpability varies considerably around the world. And I don't want to keep singling out our friends in the United States, but there are some states in America that have no lower limit on the age of criminal culpability. So whilst I think and probably most of you would think that 10 is um, a bit young, um, 
in in some parts of America, there's no flaw on on that, and that's flaw F L double O, not A W. Um, and uh, in some Scandinavian countries, the age of criminal cul culpability is up around 16 or 18. Um, in Australia, there are considerable variations across states and territories in the laws and practices. But what we can say about Australia in general, unfortunately, is that there is an overrepresentation of some groups. And here we're looking at demographic factors such as race, gender, socioeconomic status, neurodisability, and low academic attainment. So we know, for example, that um, Aboriginal children represent, I think it's something like 2% of the population and 38% of youth justice statistics across the country, higher in some states than, um, than, uh, than others in that respect. Um, gender, we're looking at uh, about a five to one ratio of males to females. Young people from low SES communities are more likely to come into contact with the youth justice system and more likely to uh, receive some kind of tariff when they go to court. Young people with a wide range of neurodisabilities are overrepresented in youth justice statistics, not necessarily well diagnosed, um, but we know that all neurodisabilities, in particular intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, uh, um, as our research has shown, language disorder, are uh, strongly overrepresented. And there's no surprises in the fact that low academic attainment is strongly represented as well. There is, as we'll see, a pipeline um, from child protection to um, youth justice. And I just want to comment briefly on the fact that uh, Victoria operates a unique, a unique dual track system when it comes to youth justice. And you won't hear a lot about this and the reason that you won't hear a lot about it is that governments of both persuasions tend to keep it quiet um, because uh, I think there's a certain anxiety that the tabloid, tabloid press um, might, um, might ruin this um, particular piece of excellent policy that's been in place for a very long time. In Victoria, magistrates are required where possible to sentence a 17-year-old to a youth justice order rather than to an adult corrections order if they're going to have their 18th birthday during um, the, the period in which they're um, sentenced or on a community-based order. And there'll be no surprises for an audience such as this that um, the reason for that is that the, um, the law recognises that the frontal lobes, the prefrontal regions in particular of 17 year olds are still extremely immature, particularly for young people who've um, got the kinds of um, histories and risk factors that this particular group has. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this doesn't operate anywhere else in Australia, and I don't think there are many places in the world, in fact, that have got this dual track system for young offenders. So in our case in Victoria, it means that the Parkville Youth Justice System in the setting centre in Melbourne is where um, the, the younger youth offenders are um, locked up. Um, and Malmesbury in central Victoria, uh, just down the road from where I live in Bendigo, is uh, where the older young offenders are, the ones who are 17 to 20 um, in the main. So uh, just a little bit of local detail for you. Now, I said I'd mentioned this notion of Dolly Incapax in relation to um, the age of criminal culpability. What this means in um, Victoria is that children who are aged 10 to 13 inclusive at the time of an alleged offence are considered to be incapable of crime. Dolly Incapax is a Latin term um, meaning incapable of, uh, I think it actually literally means incapable of evil, um, but in a legal sense, it means incapable of crime. So what this means is that the onus is on the prosecution, which is the state, to, um, to rebut the presumption that proves that the child knew that their conduct was morally wrong. So um, it's a, the default position for a child between the age of 10 and 13 
is that um, they were they're incapable of evil unless the um, prosecution can successfully rebut that. So I think you'll appreciate that that's quite a high bar that has to be um, uh, gotten over. Um, so the prosecution must point to evidence from which an inference can be drawn beyond reasonable doubt that the child's development is such that he or she knew that it was morally wrong to engage in the conduct. And this directs attention to the child's education and the environment in which the child um, has been raised. And you'll appreciate immediately the, um, the incongruity of um, establishing that the kind of young people who come into contact with the youth justice system have that level of maturity because by definition they're likely to have less um, executive function um, and cognitive um, development maturity than children who don't come in contact with the youth justice system. Now, some of you will remember, as I do, the horrific um, 1993 James Bolger case in England. Um, Jamie, Jamie Bolger was a two-year-old boy who was lured away from his mother in a busy shopping centre and, um, and murdered by, uh, beaten, assaulted and um, uh, beaten over a period of several hours and left on a railway track uh, where the inevitable happened and, and he was killed. Um, and the, the two perpetrators of this crime, you may recall, were two 10-year-old boys, Thompson and Venables. Um, and I think it's just interesting to reflect on the way the media responded to that horrific case and to ask yourself whether anything much would have changed um, in the um, nearly 30 years since 1993. Um, because uh, as you can see in this commentary here, the press court was, in, was vengeful, in a vengeful mood. Editorials expressed outrage, demanded retribution and offered a range of policy proposals designed to exact increasingly punitive measures from the criminal justice system. So they were utterly demonised. And if you do any reading about this case, you'll see that one of them has had a, a much better trajectory than the other. Um, uh, but it really um, crystallises the fact that um, communities, even in developed wealthy first world nations, are really not very good at knowing what to do with young people who commit uh, very serious offences. And fortunately, very serious offences are a very, very small proportion of what occurs in the offending behaviour of most, um, most teenagers. But um, I'm not sure that, you know, God forbid, if a, another similar case occurred, I'm not sure that we've come a very long way in terms of a, applying our understanding of children's development and how to respond to such challenging circumstances. Now, in terms of key statistics in Australia, for 10 to 17 year olds, uh, as I've already said, um, young people from ATSI backgrounds are unfortunately to our great shame, uh, very strongly overrepresented in youth justice statistics, 16 times more likely to be under community-based supervision and 22 times more likely to be incarcerated than non-ATSI peers. Males are four times more likely to be under youth justice supervision. There's generally about a five to one ratio in youth justice statistics in general uh, for uh, males to females. Um, young people in very remote areas are nine times more likely than those in major cities to be under YJ supervision. And young people, as I've already said, from low SES backgrounds are five times more likely than higher SES background young people to be um, under supervision. And that reflects a whole range of factors, not least um, of which is the extent to which a given community is seen to be um, so-called crime prone. Um, it's a term used by criminologists to reflect the fact that uh, there are higher rates of criminal activity occurring in certain communities and often goes along with higher rates of unemployment, underemployment and so forth. Now, you can find your state um, here. This is the most recent statistics that we have available. Um, you can see that there are much higher rates of um, all kinds of um, tariffs in the Northern Territory compared to other parts of Australia. And unfortunately, the rates of um, 
of young people being in contact with the youth justice uh, system in any form of supervision tend to correspond with uh, the population clustering of um, Aboriginal and Torres, Strait, Torres Strait Islander communities. So much higher rates in, and these are per capita statistics, much higher rates in the Northern Territory in uh, Western Australia and uh, Queensland. And Victoria, where I live, happens to be um, significantly lower, and that no doubt in part reflects our, our demographic characteristics and the relatively lower um, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population here. Um, there's a common belief, uh, again, particularly in the, um, in the tabloid media and, and shock jock journalists like to talk about young people being out of control and youth justice um, rates soaring and, and so forth. But when you look at the actual data, what you see is that um, youth offending rates are falling and they're falling um, really quite considerably over time and quite steadily um, over time. Um, so as you can see there from 2008 up to 2017, that's exactly the kind of um, direction that we would want things to be going in and the kind of slope that we would be wanting to see. What this does tend to mean, though, is that the young people who do end up being um, incarcerated are, in many cases, um, uh, young people with more complex histories, more complex backgrounds, and uh, histories of more serious and recidivist offending. Um, this um, slide is of great, as, great interest to me because it represents a couple of the populations that I do research in. This shows the overlap between child protection and youth justice. And we know that there's um, a very significant doorway into youth justice, unfortunately, via child protection. And what you can see here is that um, if we look at a population, a child protection population, we see that 7.7% 7, 7 of that population will also um, have had some level of youth justice um, supervision. So that's typically a community-based order. Most young people who are in contact with youth justice receive a community-based order rather than a custodial sentence. Custodial sentences are reserved, as I said, for more recidivist or serious offenders. Um, but if you look at the youth justice population, what you see is nearly half of them, uh, what has been referred to recently by the Sentencing Council of Victoria as crossover kids. So kids who've um, come into youth justice via the child protection system. Now, the thing that's important to keep in mind here is that um, it's quite hard to, um, for a whole range of reasons, to reach the point of having had a, um, a substantiated notification um, through child protection. There are a lot of notifications to child protection services that, are, that never result in substantiation. There are a lot of children who are experiencing maltreatment of various forms um, who, about whom a notification is never made. So we need to remember that this is the tip of the iceberg, but according to official statistics, nearly half of the young people in youth justice have come via child protection. So they've met that threshold of um, a substantiated um, notification. Bearing in mind that the, uh, the most common form of child maltreatment is actually neglect. So these are very, very vulnerable young people who are not having their basic developmental needs met. Basic needs of, in many cases, their physical needs for warmth and nutrition and stable housing and basic safety. Um, but they're also having their other broader social, cognitive, language and developmental needs neglected, as well as in some cases experiencing various forms of direct abuse and also um, indirect um, abuse, uh, such as experiencing uh, witnessing domestic violence. 
Okay, so this brings me then to, um, to my research. And those of you who've heard me present before will know that this um, slide kind of represents um, where, I, um, where I work in a, a research sense. Um, that, as I said at the start, I'm interested in the issue of oral language competence, and I'm interested in working two ends off against the same middle. Um, one of those ends is promoting evidence-based practice in early years of education. I can't emphasise enough the importance of getting children across the bridge to literacy, to, uh, to being on track uh, with respect to reading, writing and spelling after three years of formal schooling because we can't get that time back. Um, so in a sense, that's the, uh, the um, fences at the top of the cliff. But we also need to be thinking about better advocacy and support for vulnerable young people because there are significant um, holes in our nets and we do know that many young people slip through those nets and so here we're talking about the metaphorical ambulances at the bottom. But I do emphasise that with every year that goes past it gets harder and harder to make up um, gaps in young people's um, academic linguistic um, development. So this brings me then to the notion of the school to prison pipeline. And I think you would have already recognized um, from what I've said so far in the introduction that this has inputs at a number of developmental stages and via different service, uh, service doors. The, the term uh, school to prison pipeline has come out of um, various American uh, researchers, in particular in my head, I think of people like um, Crystal Jolivet um, and Yell as the main um, authors in this space. Um, and there's quite a lot of really quite high quality uh, literature on the school to prison pipeline and specifically on the role of reading ability as a key contributor to the school to prison pipeline. In my head, though, um, we're not just talking about literal prisons when we talk about the school to prison pipeline, particularly in a system such as ours, where fortunately we do try to divert young people away from custodial sentences. We try to keep, if, if there is a custodial sentence, we try to keep it as short as possible. I'm um, very much of the view that um, long-term social marginalisation is um, a really entrenched form of imprisonment. And when we think about the school to prison pipeline, we need to think about that um, less visible but more chronic form of imprisonment that is represented by social marginalisation, by not being able to be part of the social and economic mainstream. So, so keep that in mind as we uh, as we go through the presentation. So what's what's oral language um, doing playing in this space? What's oral language got to do with it? Just discovered, would you believe, I took my watch off at the start and put it on my laptop so that I could keep an eye on time and my watch has chosen tonight to stop. So I'm just getting my phone um, in place so that I can um, keep an eye on things. So when we're talking about oral language, there's going to be no surprises here. So I'm going to skip over these next few slides quite quickly. You all know that when we're talking about oral language skills, we're talking about everyday talking or expressive skills, and we're also talking about listening skills. And I always am at great pains to emphasize at this point that we're talking about a two-channel process. We're not just interested in children's um, ability to get words out and express ideas, that's incredibly important, but we have to be equally interested in their ability to take information in, to process information, to follow instructions, to keep up with conversations and social banter. And of course, language is a representational system. And um, so oral language is all about thoughts, ideas, opinions, views, memories. It's about carrying mental representations and getting them outside our head into the interpersonal space or onto a, a page. Language, of course, has many, many levels. It has many developmental processes that it goes through. I'm not going to spend time um, drilling down on each of those here tonight. It's got a number of different levels, and there, there's probably a lot of speech pathologists here who could talk about this in much more detail than I can. It's got the structural component, 
discourse component, the metalinguistic component, the ability to use language to talk about language, and of course, a pragmatic component, the ability to change the way we use language in interpersonal contexts so that we're um, maintaining the flow in an interpersonal exchange and not creating tears in the social fabric. And all of these um, aspects of language are very important for everyday communication success, but they're also very important for the transition to literacy and ongoing development of competency in reading, writing and spelling. So um, I'll, um, it's, it's very important, I think, to be thinking about oral language in its own right, but also what oral language confers when we make that transition to literacy. Um, and we obviously, when we're talking about oral language, we're very interested in vocabulary and structural um, components of language, such as syntax and word order and morphology, all of which are really important. But I sometimes think we don't spend enough time talking about uh, non-literal or idiomatic use of language because in everyday life, we use language idiomatically a lot. Um, I was chatting on the phone earlier to my five-year-old grandson and I said, okay, I've got to fly. Um, and he said, Nan, are you really going to fly? Um, and of course, you, you know, that, that's just a throwaway line that we use. And we, um, we use these, these kinds of linguistic devices a lot in everyday interaction. And that makes our interactions with each other more interesting, but it also makes our interactions with each other more opaque for um, people who have any kind of um, language difficulties, people from non-English speaking backgrounds, um, even people from other English speaking backgrounds who may not use the same idioms that we use. If I had time and I don't, I would step through all of these and talk about the linguistic basis of all of these because children need to be able to master these and work with these linguistic devices. It's great to have a terrific vocabulary and to be um, putting words in the right order and creating long syntactically complex sentences, but there's a lot more in everyday life to being a competent user of language than just that literal surface level of language use. There's a lot going on uh, at the non-literal, idiomatic, figurative level as well. And that's just in oral language. Have a think about what happens when we move to written text because writers don't just regurgitate those common everyday idioms that we all use very frequently, like describing someone as a black sheep or a dark horse, um, or saying don't count your chickens before they're hatched. There are lots of common idioms that we use every day. But the mark of an outstanding author is that they come up with the kinds of metaphors that you can see listed on this slide, where the reader has to really stop and think um, and, and work out how to derive meaning. Like, how can we say that the sun was a toddler? Um, the, the sun is something that's hot in the sky. What does it mean to say that the, ton, the sun was a toddler insistently refusing to go to bed? It was past 8.30 and still light. So that use of metaphoric language is much more abstract when we're dealing with written text than it is um, even than when we're dealing with, with everyday oral language exchanges where it tends to be more repetitive and more formulaic. Um, language um, is obviously closely related to heritage and culture and an important thing for us to keep in mind in Australia, in, particularly when we're talking about the youth justice population who are overrepresented in these statistics, is that our curriculum is delivered in standard Australian English. Um, and um, there are a number of challenges for our um, First Nations people when they come into contact with the law um, at all stages of that process. So again, unfortunately, not an aspect of the topic that I have time to drill down on um, tonight, but it is very important for us to keep in mind the strong links between language and culture and heritage. Um, many of you will have seen this model before. Um, it's in a paper that I published this year. Um, I'm going to try and fly through it now, but this is my metaphor of building a language house. And I guess what I'm trying to do here in relation to 
um, oral language and the role of oral language skills in the transition to literacy is take a broader child development lens on um, something that many people, probably myself included, have perhaps been focusing on quite narrowly in recent years when we look at um, how instruction is approached um, in the first three years of school. I think it's instructive for all of us to keep in mind the complexity of what teachers are dealing with um, in, the, in their school day um, and the complexity that children are dealing with in their lives, in, which in many cases they're not able to articulate. So the metaphor here is that when we build a house, we can't start with walls and we can't start with the roof. When we build a house, we have to start with foundations. And before we can even start with foundations, we have to think about the ground that the foundations are going to be built on. And if I had another hour, I would talk to you about the importance of the social and emotional context for early language use in infancy, the first two years of life, the importance of serve and return interactions for creating neural pathways um, and the importance of that warm, responsive interpersonal space of infants and young children being uh, reared by adults who are child focused, who themselves are well emotionally um, self-regulated so that they can use language for soothing, which is the beginnings of um, emotional self-regulation, being able to be soothed by another person when you're distressed. And that often has words um, wrapped around it, that, that soothing. Um, and we also see in the first two years of life, the, uh, the use of words to describe affective states, our own and those of others. And so that's the beginnings of empathy when we can talk about emotional states. So this solid ground um, is incredibly important in this model. Then we can have a think about the first five years of oral language experience expressively and receptively. This is like a big piece of granite um, laying the foundations for the house. Um, and you would all be aware that there is uh, a lot of variability in the quantity and quality of the language that children are exposed to in that time. Um, then and only then can we start to think about the walls of the house. Now, the wall on the right hand side represents the development of pro-social interpersonal skills and the wall on the left hand side represents the transition to reading, writing and spelling. So the idea here is that oral language is really important and oral language competence is really important in its own right because it's what we use to navigate the business of everyday life. But it's also important because it drives that transition to reading, writing and spelling. But on the right hand side, we've got something that's biologically natural or biologically primary, um, albeit it's not set and forget because children arrive at school with quite uh, widely varying levels of uh, uh, vocabulary exposure, sentence complexity, narrative discourse skills and, and so forth. Um, and so there we're interested in the influence of the home language and literacy environment, which is very hard for us to directly impact. On the left hand side, um, we've got the, um, we focus on the instructional environment, which is a space where we can make a difference. So whilst it's hard for us to go into the homes of infants and preschoolers, and mandate how their parents um, talk to them and interact with them. Probably a good thing that we can't do that. We do get to influence what happens in the instructional environment. But of course, as you all know, there's a wide level of variability in what happens in those instructional environments. Now, the factors listed on both sides of this slide are not meant to be in a linear order. And of course, there's a lot of crossover um, between the walls. So it's not just um, uh, vocabulary development isn't just happening on one in one side of the house and not on the other side of the house, for example. It's very difficult to um, represent something that's really quite three dimensional in this way. So the walls, um, as you can see, are embedded solidly in the foundations. They're not sitting on top of the foundations. And they are built up over many years across the primary and secondary years of school. 
Um, but before we can put a roof on the house, we need a strong structural beam. And that strong structural beam um, is provided through social, emotional and behavioural wellbeing and social cognition skills. Social cognition, of course, refers to our ability to read the play, to fit in. Um, it, it's related to pragmatic um, communication abilities, our ability to draw inferences, to, um, to tease out uh, what might appear to be um, uh, inconsistencies between a verbal component of a message and a nonverbal component of a message. These are skills that are sometimes collectively referred to in the um, employment sector as soft skills. They're skills that employers love. I, I don't like the term soft skills because I think it downplays their importance for everyday um, success and for the ability to get and maintain um, work and to form and maintain friendships. Um, uh, these are skills that are difficult to teach and their absence incurs quite a strong social penalty. So then if we've got that beam in place, we can think about the roof of the house. And the roof in this model, of course, is having young people stay at school and achieve academically so that they can transition to further education or training um, and be part of the social and economic mainstream and have uh, emerged from all of this with marketable employment skills. Um, bearing in mind that we, like um, our neighbours in other first world OECD nations, live in economies that are heavily influenced by artificial intelligence and technology and our, um, our employment markets are heavily influenced by those things as well, such that jobs for unskilled workers are disappearing. So we cannot afford at any level economically socially, philosophically, um, to have young people exiting school at the age of 15 who can't go on to um, further vocational training or higher education because they're entering a workforce that simply has fewer and fewer jobs for unskilled workers. And I, I see this as quite a, a significant impending crisis for us in Australia when we put it up against our um, falling um, standards of academic um, achievement and um, problems that we all know exist in relation to reading, uh, reading abilities, because without reading, you don't get to build those walls up and you don't, you certainly don't get to put a roof on your house if you haven't made the transition to literacy in the first three years of school. Language development, of course, um, hangs around, if you like, to use the vernacular with a wide range of other cognitive, other developmental processes. Um, it's not um, operating in isolation developmentally at all. Um, so it's, uh, it's occurring alongside various aspects of cognitive development, social cognition that I've already touched on, emotional self-regulation, having words for feelings is greatly uh, beneficial if you want to talk about feelings and deal with feelings. And of course, it's related to memory, working memory, short-term and long-term memory. Um, I've already talked about social cognition as being part of that um, beam, but it, it starts right down in the solid ground part of the, the language house model. And it's important to remember, of course, that one of the things that makes social cognition so challenging is the fact that we humans are socialised to play against our emotions. And we do that to maintain our face, to maintain face for other people and to ensure that there aren't those tears in the social fabric. It's interesting in relation to young people in the youth justice system that we know that their social cognition skills um, as a population are not strong. And we know that this particular group, when they're exposed to um, ambiguous social cues, are likely to favour a hostile attribution. So if there's a social cue that could be interpreted neutrally or might be interpreted in a hostile, as having a hostile intent, young people in the youth justice system will default to um, making a hostile attribution. And that may well be quite a functional 
decision to make if they've come from very volatile, unsafe um, home environments where, um, for example, adults raising their voices um, uh, mean uh, impending threat, um, then it might be safer to assume hostility and um, to, to take protective action. But of course, this causes difficulties for these young people in the interpersonal space. And it means that sometimes situations get out of hand very quickly when um, there's a, a recourse to physical ways of dealing with that social ambiguity rather than um, drawing on a often quite thin verbal toolkit. Um, so we know, as I said, that there is a, an SES gradient that children sit on uh, with respect to their kind of uh, the kinds of preschool language exposure that they experience in particular. This is important when we're talking about young people in the youth justice system because of that overlap between low SES um, with um, risk for um, involvement in the youth justice system. And I always like to call on Daniel Willingham when I talk about this and um, remind myself and people that I'm engaging with that we also need to think about human and social capital because some families are low on economic capital, but they're not necessarily low on human and social capital. But unfortunately, young people who end up in the youth justice system tend to come from families that are low on both sides of that ledger. So when we're talking about language, um, I always encourage people to, to think about the paradox that we have to hold when we're talking about language. It's this thing that we have evolved a special advantage for as humans in the sense that it's biologically primary and we have what Steven Pinker has referred to as a language instinct but it's also highly vulnerable and it's vulnerable to just about every neurobiological um, dis disability disorder that you can think of, uh, which uh, are also strongly overrepresented in youth justice statistics. And it's also highly sensitive to environmental exposure. So yes, it's biologically innate, but it's not said and forget. Okay, how are we going time-wise? Oh, not brilliant, Pam, not brilliant. Okay, um, let me just have a quick look at my cheat sheet so I can make an assessment of uh, what I might... Uh... All right, I'm just going to talk fast. When children start school, we ask them to, you'll see that I quite like metaphors, we ask them to cross a bridge, a metaphorical bridge, and this is a life-changing bridge for children who get across it. On the near bank, we've got oral language, talking and listening, song and rhyme, hopefully text exposure, all the things that we want to see richly represented in the preschool years. On the far bank, and, and those are the biologically primary um, uh, assets, if you like, that we've evolved for as humans. On the far bank, for children who get across what you can see is quite a precarious bridge, we've got the biologically secondary, biologically unnatural reading, writing and spelling, the things that need to be taught. You probably can't even remember being on a bridge. Uh, most of you probably just found yourself on the other side and, and away you went. Some of you will remember being on the bridge, but not all of you. Now, for children um, who make the, the transition to literacy, so we, we know, as I've said, it's not biologically natural. It requires specific and prolonged instruction. It's, it, I think it's important to remind ourselves that reading is a recent development in evolutionary terms. We've only been doing it for about 6,000 years. Um, and of course, getting across that bridge is building directly on oral language competencies that were acquired before school entry. So when we think of this in a, an adolescent mental health risk and protective factor framework, Making the transition to literacy is extremely important because it promotes academic achievement, it promotes school attachment and retention, and it promotes positive self-esteem. It's one of those things that helps to make children feel good about being at school and probably reduces the likelihood of disruptive off-task behaviour. And we know that there are strong associations between reading difficulties and behavioural problems and disruption and, uh, as I said, off-task behaviour um, in classrooms. 
So I think about the transition to literacy very explicitly as an important mental health protect, protective factor because academic achievement is a mental health protective factor. Academic underachievement is a mental health risk factor. Now, that doesn't mean that they are completely deterministic, but achieving academically doesn't vaccinate you against mental health adversities, but it protects you um, in ways that you're not protected if you're not achieving academically. That leaves you exposed and more vulnerable to a range of internalising and externalising mental health problems. So what's the relationship between oral language and literacy? Well, people like me bang on ad nauseum about the arrow at the top, um, the fact that oral language skills are fundamental to making that transition to literacy, to getting across the bridge. But we need to remember that the arrows go both ways, that getting across the bridge has a profound importance for children's ongoing oral language abilities. If you think back to the language house, those walls are building up incrementally every year and we need children by the middle primary school years to be doing their own reading and to be discovering new words through their own reading uh, and we know that they do that when they drop them into the conversation and mispronounce them and that's a wonderful thing when that happens we want them to be exposed to the kind of um, non-literal linguistic devices that we saw in those examples of metaphor earlier, the kinds of original metaphors that writers come up with. They don't just regurgitate the black sheep and, um, and the counting chickens before they're hatched and the um, dark horse metaphors that we use every day. Writers come up with their own metaphors. They also use long syntactically and conceptually complex sentences. So the fact that these arrows go in both directions is profoundly important. Um, but hopefully you're starting to think about the, the haves and the have nots here in terms of who are the children who are gonna be in that school to prison pipeline and who's staying away from the school to prison pipeline. So we know that um, literacy has profound um, significance at a population level. Um, it's, uh, it's what I think of as a modifiable social determinant of health and well-being across the lifespan. And we know, you know, that low literacy levels correspond with all of the factors that you can see listed here on the left-hand side of the slide. So what does all of this have to do with vulnerable young people? Well, if we look at the, uh, the factors that aggregate in the developmental histories of young people who end up in the youth justice system, this is what we see um, clustering together. We see an over-representation of all of the factors that you can see listed here. Um, I've highlighted their history of behaviour and conduct disturbance because that, that's the single thing that is most obvious to the adults in that child's life, the fact that they have um, externalising behaviour problems, attention problems, conduct disorders, oppositional defiant disorder, off-task behaviour, um, or all the different varieties of um, behaviours that distract adults and often prevent us from um, peeling the onion, if you like, and seeing what else is going on beneath that behaviour. Um, some of you would be familiar with the work done by Nancy Cohen and her colleagues in Toronto, and they published a paper a long time ago now, I think it was back in 1993, well, they took a sample of primary school aged boys who were referred to a local CAM service, a child and adolescent mental health service because of externalizing behavior problems. And they tested their language skills. And they found that um, I think it was 35% um, off the top of my head actually met criteria for diagnosis of language disorder back at that time. And they met criteria for receiving services. None of them were receiving services. They also found that there, were, um, that there was a, a correlation between the severity of the behavior disturbance and the severity of the language disorder. Um, and Nancy Cohen and her colleagues made the point at that time Time that children find their way into the service delivery system by virtue of what the key adults in their world see as the primary handicapping condition. And if you're a child who has got learning difficulties and behaviour problems, 
chances are the adults in your world are going to see the behaviour problems as the primary handicapping condition because the behaviour problems disrupt the adult's day more than your learning difficulties disrupt the adult's day. Now we can look at all of these factors and I don't have time to talk about the early death um, factor there, but um, I will tell you that young people in contact with the youth justice system die at an alarmingly higher rate than their age peers who are not in contact with the youth justice system. Now we can look at all of those same factors though and say and ask ourselves what their implications are for language development. And of course, what we see is a perfect storm of risk factors because of what I was talking about earlier with language being a paradox. It's biologically innate, but it's highly vulnerable to a range of intrinsic um, factors such as um, neurodisabilities, but also experiential factors and environmental factors. So it perhaps shouldn't be too surprising um, that we and others have found what we have found when we've gone looking at the language skills of this population. Now, again, really um, broad helicopter view here and gosh, the time's terrible. <laughs> okay. Um, our research and research of um, overseas workers shows that around 50 to 60 percent of young male offenders would meet a clinical diagnostic threshold for language disorder that can't be explained on the basis of low IQ, disability or mental health problems, all of which are nevertheless overrepresented in this population. Um, we've identified links between language disorder and severity of interpersonal um, offending. Um, we've found higher rates of language disorder in young people who enter the youth justice system via child protection, um, higher rates of language disorder in young people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds, even when we were very particular about exposing, uh, controlling for exposure to standard Australian English um, in their lives. We've also reported higher rates of language disorder in young female offenders. Um, this is a, uh, an open access paper that we published this year about young people in the um, adolescence in the child protection system and I'll make sure that Michael has a copy of that so that that can be shared with you. Um, we've also published a paper on young people in flexible learning programs, uh, again showing very worrying levels of um, rates of language disorder. This is um, an, some examples just so that it can, we can bring the data to life a little bit and you, can, you will know you're an expert audience who work with um, vulnerable students every day. Um, so these are examples from the self for formulating sentences subtest that I think give a good sense of just how thin these young people's language skills are. So these are from a sample who had an average age of 16. Um, and these are quite typical representative responses um, from that sample. Okay. Uh, I really am going to have to skip over some slides here or Michael will never invite me back. I'll make sure the PowerPoint presentation is available to you. Um, language problems occur across the board. Um, we, we didn't find any particular areas of strength in our research. Um, having a language disorder makes it hard to do all of the things that you can see listed on this slide. Um, I do sometimes talk in these presentations about David Corson's notion of the lexical bar, which I think is really important for vulnerable students because that's the distance between the kind of language used in everyday oral language exchanges versus the, versus the kind of language that's used in written texts. And of course, these young people never get across the lexical bar because they don't, um, they don't achieve reading, writing and spelling abilities that allow them to engage with text. So it's not surprising that they get left behind and they get left behind very early. We've published quite a bit out of this research and we've um, identified implications in the four key areas that you can see bolded um, on this slide. 
This is another open access publication that those of you who work in schools might be interested in. It's some guidelines about how to elicit um, accurate narrative accounts from children when incidents occur um, in the school context because children with um, language difficulties often get tangled up in behavioural incidents but are not very good at providing verbal accounts of their behaviour, um, which can then make them quite disadvantaged in um, how um, events um, unfold. Key important takeaways that language problems are invisible, language problems, language disorders masquerade as a whole raft of other factors that create layers of disadvantage for these young people. When we're looking at boys with behaviour problems and learning difficulties, we need to be seeing red flags um, and turning over the rocks, um, building on the findings of people like Nancy Coe and all those years ago um, who told us that, OK, the behaviour is the entry point into the service delivery system, but let's have a proper full developmental look at this child and find the other factors that we need to be um, addressing. Um, because uh, if, we, if we don't do that, that there's a significant proportion of these children who are going to end up in that school to prison pipeline. Now, should you have a perverse desire to create a school to prison pipeline, I've thoughtfully included the recipe for you here. There won't be anything there that you don't recognise. And of course, you can flip that around the other way to find out how to prevent school to prison pipelines occurring. One thing I do want to say is don't try and sell me functional literacy. I'm not interested in functional literacy. I think that's a crock. And particularly in a first world economy such as ours, where there aren't jobs for um, uh, people who don't have formal qualifications and training, uh, we, we should not be setting our expectations so low as to think that functional literacy is okay. Um, I don't think it's really um, possible or feasible or fair to be asking 15 and 16 year olds who actually have mid primary level um, language and literacy skills if they're lucky to be engaging with the secondary curriculum and I don't see how they can engage with the secondary curriculum. And our, uh, our study on young people in flexible alternative education systems would suggest that that's really virtually impossible, which for me really ramps up the urgency of building those fences at the top of the cliff and making sure that we're making the most of every moment in every day, in particularly the first three years of school, but not just the first three years of school. Um, these are the words of Rod Morgan, who was the UK Youth Justice Chair, who said back in 2007 that it might be too much to say that if we reformed our schools, we'd have no need of prisons. But if we better engaged our children and young people in education, we would almost certainly have less need of prisons. Effective crime prevention has arguably more to do with education than sentencing policy. And I think for me, it's about the detail of what goes on in classrooms uh, that constitutes education. It's not just about engagement. It's about making sure that these young people are making progress academically and acquiring knowledge and skills that count um, in our economy in which there are, uh, there are not opportunities for them beyond school if they can't transition to further training and, and higher education. Does that make me a neo neoliberal? I don't know. I think it makes me a social justice warrior. Um, I'm going to end on this slide, um, and this is really just to reinforce that it's everybody's responsibility to be supporting these young people at every point um, in their passage through um, school, and we need to do everything that we can from a social justice perspective to make sure that education is a pathway away from every form of imprisonment and towards opportunity for all children, but particularly for those children who've got that over aggregation of risk factors working against them. So I do apologise that I've really um, gone on too long. <laughs> Oh, that's another open access paper that I'll make available to Michael to share. All right, thanks so much, Pam. That was a, a wonderful presentation. And Pam's kindly offered to answer any questions uh, through her Twitter account. So if you don't follow Pam on Twitter, um, she's more than happy to follow. We are out of time uh, this evening, but um, 
Michael, I'm happy to stay for five minutes if people want to. I feel do feel bad that I've managed time so badly that I haven't That's left right. people any time for questions. So, if, um, Michael, if you need to go, that that's fine. No, no, that's I'm, fine. I'm happy uh, to stay. I will ask you one question, Pam. I'll start off. There's just a whole lot of comments saying what a good presentation it was, but. Um, I've worked in a detention centre for, for youth offenders and I'm currently a board member of a school for disengaged senior secondary boys. Um, and your figure of the 50 to 60% would hold true with, with my experiences there in terms of student uh, young people um, having language disorders and, and basically not being able to read or, and write. Do you know of anywhere around the world, and we know what recidivism is like as well. Um, do you know of anywhere in the world that's actually um, intervening with the young people who are incarcerated through programs um, that have, are proven to work to, to you know, teach um, mm. young, young adults or uh, older adolescents um, skills to read um, yeah. as an example or oral language programs? It's a great question. And one of the ironies of our progressive diversional approach in Australia is that young people don't stay in contact. You know, they don't have long custodial sentences, mm -hmm. um, which is a good thing, but it also means, um, you know, we don't perhaps get that intervention opportunity. Um, I, I, don't, I think there are many custodial settings that have a go at this, um, but with very varying levels of um, intensity and fidelity and precision. Um, and we also need to remember that um, when young people come into a custodial setting, you know, they're often um, coming down from um, substance addiction and abuse. Um, there's a lot of psychological turmoil that needs to be um, reined in and dealt with first. Um, so I, I guess my, my bottom line on this is that we don't want young people going to prison to learn to read. We want them going to school to learn to read. School's a really great place to learn to read. Prison's a very bad place to learn to read. Um, and, you know, getting the right, well-qualified staff, I mean, wherever you worked was lucky to have you, but that's not necessarily the norm. Um, and uh, so I, I think we need to be focusing on the fences at the top of the cliff on this one. Absolutely. And I don't, I don't think there's any other pressing questions here. So we, we will wrap it up. But, um, you know, just on that point, and, and uh, LDA certainly exists uh, as an organisation to try and put those fences up and really advocate for um, effective instruction in our schools. And, and that's what we're set up to really promote. Um, so I would like to just do a little plug for LDA mm -hmm. Um, and, and what we do do. So if you're not a member, please consider joining. Um, if you are a member, please advocate to other professionals because uh, what we're trying to do is, is exactly what Pam's advocating there and, and reduce considerably that, that number of students who are in that vulnerable um, category as well as other students who don't have uh, that mental um, protective factor that that language can give you so um, that's really important again thanks so much Pam for your presentation it's wonderful that you've agreed to do this for us this evening I managed to press the record button correctly this evening as well which is a, a bonus so I hope that um, this will be up on our YouTube channel uh, in the coming days so if you'd like to have a look at it again Pam's also promised to share the slides as well. So I'll share the slides and um, those um, open access publications as well. Yeah. So thanks very much to everybody for your attendance this evening. Uh, and we'll see you all same channel next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, thanks everyone. So much, thanks, Pam. Michael. Good Thank night. Thank you. Bye-bye.